The fourth series saw Thomas and Friends reach their 100th episode, titled "Thomas and the Special Letter." During this time, Britt Allcroft and the team were developing a full-length feature film starring the beloved characters from the Island of Sodor. The result was Thomas and the Magic Railroad. In this story, there is a secret railroad connecting the island of Sodor and Shining Time. The evil Diesel Ten arrives on Sodor with unfinished business to find and destroy the lost engine, Lady, and the magic railroad that holds the two worlds together peacefully. It is up to Thomas, Mister Conductor, Burnett Stone, and their family and friends to band together. As they solve the mystery of the magic railroad and save their universe before Diesel Ten finds the lost magic engine first. In late 1995, producer Britt Allcroft received a phone call from Barry London, the chairman and CEO of Destination Films and former vice chairman for Paramount Pictures. He explained that his three-year-old daughter was a big fan of Thomas the Tank Engine. And would love to meet with her in person. After meeting and discussing the idea, a contract was signed on February 27, 1996, for a full-length Thomas feature. Britt began writing a very intricate and detailed story. Working titles included Thomas and the Rainbow Railway, but the final film title would ultimately be Thomas and the Magic Railroad. Around the same time, a Shining Time Station film was in discussion. After four television specials, there was potential to bring a full-length feature to audiences everywhere. Co-creator Rick Sigelkow was crafting a story as early as 1993. The concept was to be featured around the Shining Time Station franchise, while incorporating Thomas as a supporting character. He explained that the plot conceived had a circus train coming to Shining Time. However, an evil ringmaster kidnaps Mr. Conductor, and it's up to Thomas and his friends to come to his rescue. Throughout the story, a circus girl and the Shining Time kids became friends, and they helped her overcome her fear of horses to become a stunt rider for the circus. It even had a scene with Schemer being shot from a cannon. Unfortunately, the initial movie idea was eventually dropped as the series came to a close, and Rick joined BBC Worldwide America Children's Distribution. During the pre-production stage, Thomas and the Magic Railroad was planned to be filmed at Shepperton Studios. Unfortunately. The final filming for model sequences would be shifted to Toronto, Canada, as production began. In 1998, Britt was on holiday in Scotland when she heard about the Isle of Man's tax incentives for independent filmmakers. Intrigued, she took a trip out to the location and was impressed with the island's Sudrian-like beauty. The Isle of Man would become a primary filming location for the motion picture. On February 11, 1999, Destination Films and Galane Pictures announced the movie's release would be slated for the summer of 2000. Later that year, the crew began filming on the Isle of Man for the Shining Time and Muffle Mountain scenes. The station itself was filmed. At the Castletown Railway Station, additional filming locations included the Stroudsburg Railroad in Pennsylvania and the Amtrak Station in Harrisburg. The Amtrak Station would be where Lily boards the wrong train. One of the first actors cast for the film was Peter Fonda. The movie was now in need of a new conductor character, as George Carlin had left the role. When Shining Time Station ended in 1997, it was Peter Fonda that suggested Alec Baldwin for the role. Alec accepted the role and took his place in the esteemed line of conductors. Alec stated on his experience with Allcroft in his memoir, 
Britt Allcroft was one of the kindest and lovely people I've ever worked with. I've often had my eye out for children's programming because of my own kids. Working with Britt was one of the best experiences I've ever had as Britt coaxes the child out of each cast member, which I found sweet and fun. Plus, I got to go shoot a movie with Peter Fonda. <laughs> Diddy Khan reprised her role as Station Master Stacy Jones, while the late Russell Means took over for Tom Jackson in the role of Billy Two Feathers. Rounding out the talented cast is Mara Wilson in her final film as Burnett's granddaughter, Lily. Mara was well known as a former child actress for other films, including the 1994 remake of Miracle on 34th Street, Mrs. Doubtfire, and Matilda. Alongside Allcroft, several people that worked on the original series also worked on the movie, including David Mitten as a model unit creative consultant, David Eaves as model special effects supervisor, Steve Asquith as model supervisor, and Terence Permain as director of photography for the model section. The picture was filmed in approximately two months. Various effects were incorporated to evoke the unique vision for the film. As this would be the first time live actors would interact with the Thomas characters, chroma key and green screens played a huge role in accomplishing this task. The journey from shining time keeps getting bumpier and bumpier. Does it? A big bully diesel is back, Mr. Conductor. You had better be careful. Sir Topham had warned me about diesel. Don't worry, Thomas. I'll just pop in and out with my sparkle wherever he goes and keep him in order. I hope. The Magic Railroad would be created using a combination of effects, including models, CGI, and water painting matte scenes by the late artist Ole Valenyuk. The final segments were filmed and production wrapped on December 17, 1999. The official Thomas and the Magic Railroad website was launched by the Britt Allcroft Company in March 2000. After an unsuccessful test screening in a Los Angeles shopping mall, Britt was forced to make drastic changes in the editing suite by the executive producers. The creative team oversaw massive changes during this process. This would include the replacement of Michael Angelus, originally portraying Percy and James, with Linda Ballantyne and Susan Roman, respectively. The feedback was Michael Angelus sounded too old and that these characters needed a more youthful sound. Ha! Thomas himself would receive a new voice as well. Isle of Man resident and part-time taxi driver, John Bellis, was driving Britt and her film crew around when Britt came to the revelation that John's voice was perfect for Thomas. Unfortunately, this casting decision would not last. He recalled his good fortune to be the voice of the Little Blue Engine during an interview by BBC News. It's fantastic, uh, everybody. I'm a bit shell-shocked still, to be honest with you. I've got to keep pinching myself, uh, realizing that, that, that it's happened. Uh, all the lads at work, uh, they're really supportive. The management at work are really supportive. And they're all going around singing Thomas the Tank Tunes. John was later flown to Toronto for the recording session, along with Michael Angelus, Keith Scott, and Patrick Breen, the narrator of Britt Allcroft's Magic Adventures of Mumphy. However, John was also cut from the film due to complaints about his Liverpudlian accent from American test audiences. He was ultimately replaced by Eddie Glenn for the final cut. I'll save a seat for you. In spite of admittedly feeling gutted over the fact that he was cut from the movie, he would still be credited as transportation coordinator. He even stated, it was supposed to be my big break, but it hasn't put me off and I'm hoping something else will come along. Before Bellis and Glenn, Acclaimed actors Bob Hoskins and Ian McGregor auditioned for the role, but they were both dropped in favor of Bellis. Australian voice actor Keith Scott 
was originally hired to voice the film's main antagonist, Diesel 10, but was later replaced with Neil Crone for the final cut as well. Crone originally provided a Russian accent for the character, but the test audience found it offensive, and it was changed to be a stylized New Jersey accent. Patrick Breen, the voice of Diesel 10's sidekicks, Splatter and Dodge, would also be replaced by Neil Crone and Kevin Frank, respectively. Audiences that watched the final version of the film would not realize there was another human character that didn't make it to the theatrical cut. P.T. Boomer, portrayed by the late Doug Lennox, served as a nemesis of Burnett Stone and a rebel in the Indian Valley Railroad where Shining Time Station resides. Boomer was jealous of Burnett's relationship with his late wife Tasha and was back to cause chaos. Boomer is described in an earlier script as being a drifter through choice, not circumstance. The test audience declared Boomer to be too scary, which led to the villain being cut from the film, making Diesel 10 the film's main antagonist. However, Doug Lennox did make a brief appearance in the final cut of the film, albeit as a motorcycle rider. As some trailers were released before the final edits were completed, you can see Boomer in a few scenes, specifically here, falling off of Diesel 10. In this trailer, you can also hear John Bellis as Thomas. Joe Woody, I'm on my way to bring the magic back. I'll get you through puffball. No, you won't. Originally, the lost engine, Lady, was not meant to have a speaking role. This was changed, and the voice would be provided by Britt Allcroft herself. So, Burnett, you didn't forget about magic. It's safe inside you. Edward was the only main engine to remain absent from later drafts, and ultimately the final cut of the film. Phil Fairley recalls that there was not enough screen time and no opportunity to properly utilize his character. George and Cranky were also intended to have roles in the early scripts of the movie, but dropped from the final version. Whilst George's role was ultimately cut from the film, Cranky's base can be spotted in the scene where Diesel 10 slinks out of the engine shed at Knapford after overhearing Thomas and Percy's conversation about the magic buffers. Cranky had a non-speaking role in two scenes, first in the deleted music video, The Friendship Song, and later in the scene where he drops some damaged oil cans all over Diesel 10 for comedic effect. The latter scene was instead altered to have Diesel 10 buried in coal in the movie. Now it's time for the next lesson, huh? I call it how to stop being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> now that's gonna ruin my facial. In the original script, Diesel 10's claw did not have a name. Actor Neil Crone was improvising a few lines of dialogue with Kevin Frank inside the recording studio, and Pinchy was the result. The team loved it, so Pinchy stayed. I can do whatever I want. I'll get him too with Pinchy. <laughs> yeah. oh. Ow, Pinchy! I hate it when you do that. <laughs> In the original script, the story of Thomas and the Magic Railroad was intended to be told by an adult Lily to her children 20 years later. This changed to Alec Baldwin as Mr. Conductor, who also narrates the film. This is the island of Sodor where Thomas and his friends live. It's at one end of my special universe. Several TV series songs were intended to be featured in the film. Thomas's anthem and the island song were potential songs to be used as opening musical sequences, and Night Train was to be used when Thomas and Percy were pulling their mail trains. In the end, the only song from the TV series to be used in the final cut was Really Useful Engine. Out of all the scenes that were removed from the final cut, 
there is one deleted scene that was commercially released on DVD featuring Junior called Sunday Surprise. The 1999 US teaser poster had John Barry credited as composer as he was originally signed on to the project. Due to scheduling conflicts, he left the project and Hummy Man took his place as the film score composer and songwriter, much to Allcroft's satisfaction. Additionally, there were two versions of Shining Time with different singers. One was a shortened version sung by Neil Donnell as heard in the movie, and the entire song performed by Marin Ord that can be heard during the end credits and on the movie soundtrack CD. The full version of Neil Donnell's cover that was not featured in the soundtrack was uploaded to SoundCloud by composer Hummy Man on May 13, 2017. By late June 2000, just a few weeks after the test audience screening, Britt Allcroft and editor Ron Wiseman completed the editing process on the movie's final cut, just in time for the official theatrical release dates. William Harris, former managing director for the Britt Allcroft Company, stated the final cut costs were estimated at 13 million pounds, making that 19 million US dollars. On July 9, 2000, five days before the film's official release date in the UK, the film made a charity premiere showing at London's Odeon Cinemas in Leicester Square. The screening was followed by a children's party featuring authentic steam locomotive number 47298 albeit repainted, to resemble the number one engine himself. Britt Allcroft, Mara Wilson, and Michael E. Rogers, who played Mr. Conductor's cousin Junior in the movie, attended the premiere, along with approximately 2,000 children. Thomas and the Magic Railroad was released on July 14, 2000, in over 300 cinemas in Great Britain. The film was well received and was best described as cool by British film critics nationwide. Even so, there were numerous problems. The use of the term railroad instead of railway in the title did not read well with British audiences. In addition, they were unfamiliar with Shining Time Station, which led to the accusations that Thomas was allegedly Americanized. However, Britt denied the allegation, as she maintained the use of familiar elements like that in the stories of Thomas and preserved them in the film. The main purpose for utilizing Shining Time Station in the plot was intended to appeal to the wide general audience that would sit and watch a 90-minute family film. The UK box office took in 170,000 pounds during its second weekend of screening. The North American premieres took place in the Lowe's Cineplex Century Plaza in Los Angeles on July 22nd and at Paramount Theatres in Toronto the following day. However, the movie received mixed to negative reviews when it was officially released in the US. While there were film critics who showed their appreciation towards the movie, some mainstream critics, like Roger Ebert, criticized the film for lacking its redeeming qualities. You don't see it so much there, but Peter Fonda goes through most of this movie in what looks like a very deep depression, maybe <laughs> clinical. He's depressed because he has trouble bringing Lady the Locomotive back to life. I just can't make her steam, he says. Maybe he's also depressed because Thomas and the Magic Railroad seems so unsure of itself. Both Fonda and Baldwin seem stranded here in a world that never really becomes charming or magical or certainly even convincing. Well, you know, Peter Fonda and Alec Baldwin, I'm watching these guys and thinking, what, James Woods wasn't available? I mean, the <laughs> casting on this is unbelievable. And yeah, Peter Fonda seems to be in some other movie. And Alec Baldwin's oh. trying to, I'm going to do a kid's movie now. And you mentioned about the trains and how they don't talk. Now, yeah. trains are already stuck on tracks, yeah. right? So now they're stuck immobile sort of on tracks. They can only go this way. And they're going, woo, woo. Yeah, and, their and that's eyes about the around. level of yeah. the animation yeah. on here, and with all the fun things you can do these days with modern special effects, to have these little choo-choo trains I know. going. Now the, 
The lips don't it's move. It's a nightmare. On, the lips don't move on PBS, but maybe that's because they have a low budget. But the lips should move. Oh. I mean, either that or the eyes shouldn't move. You know, take your choice. Well, and read my lips. This is now, a bad movie. Enough, Fonda's performance <laughs> is not bad. It's in the wrong movie. <laughs> yeah. It should be in something by Eugene O'Neill. Exactly. He's sitting there. Well, I just can't. You know, I've been here inside this mountain for all very, my life. Very, very perplexing. And, you know, and a lady won't movie. steam, and I'm just so depressed. And you're saying, you know, live it up. You know, this is for kids under five. Common Sense Media gave the film a rating of three out of five, with the consensus: will please many fans, but plot might confuse kids. After Thomas and the Magic Railroad made it to limited cinema screenings in the United States for nine weeks, it grossed $19.7 million, of which over $15 million was raised domestically, with contributed foreign distribution making up the remainder of more than $3 million, according to Box Office Mojo. The film had broken even with its budget, despite being referred to as a box office flop by some Hollywood critics. Thomas and the Magic Railroad currently has a score of 19% on Rotten Tomatoes, with a consensus that read out, Kids these days demand cutting-edge special effects, or at least a clever plot with cute characters. This movie has neither, having lost in its Americanization what the British original did so right. On the bright side, The Magic Railroad still has a cult following to this day, with tie-in merchandising including VHS and DVD, books, wooden railway products, the movie soundtrack, print studio CD-ROM, and the Ertl diecast range. In the end, the film was nominated two times for Mara Wilson's performances, won by Young Star Awards for Best Young Actress in a Comedy Film in 2000, and the other by the Young Artist Award for Best Performance by a Leading Young Actress in a Feature Film in 2001. The film made its television premiere on Sky Movies in 2002. Two years later, it was broadcast on BBC One on New Year's Day 2004, and again on December 29th, 2008. In 2015, it was broadcasted on PBS Sprouts in the United States on Independence Day. Thomas and the Magic Railroad was intended to be Brit's most tremendous success, but had ultimately become her biggest downfall. In September 2000, she stepped down as company deputy chairperson, but remained active with her involvement on the show. During this time, Brit Allcroft Productions underwent a major reorganization and renamed itself Ghislaine Entertainment. Ghislaine held the rights to not only Thomas, but to other children's television properties like Sooty, Captain Pugwash, Mumphy, Fireman Sam, and Art Attack. But of all children's properties in the company's portfolio, Thomas proudly stood out as the strongest property and ascended to the rank of number one children's preschool property in 2000 and has maintained that position since. So, in spite of bad press and reviews of the film within the U.S., Thomas's popularity still chuffs to new heights, even after the new millennium. Additionally, Ghislaine Entertainment snapped the rights of the Guinness Book of Records in a 45.5 million pounds cash deal. In the summer of 2001, a survey of 81 children with autism and Asperger's syndrome was conducted by the National Autistic Society to better understand the special connection with the little blue engine himself. Since the television show gained its popularity with autistic children, it was especially known for recognizing facial expression, colors of the engines, a clear and calm tone and narration, and storylines that were easy to follow. Many parents mentioned that Thomas provides a much needed security blanket for their children, which assists in mitigating their autistic episodes 
and allows them to relax and enjoy the stories of the friendly characters. In America, the Ertl range was discontinued and the take-along toys were produced by Learning Curve and RC2, which went on to effectively discontinue the Ertl toy range in all territories in 2004. As pre-production started on Series 6, scheduled for late 2001, there were plans and rumors to expand the series, including a spin-off with Thomas's non-rail friends Bertie the Bus and Harold the Helicopter. According to William Harris, the company wanted to expand some of Thomas's friends, particularly some of the off-track characters. Children would like to know what happens to Bertie when he goes back to his bus shed. This proposed spin-off would eventually become Jack in the Pack, which will be touched upon a little later. Series 6 marked the first season to ever use individual writers other than Brit, who would not take a direct hand in writing anymore, and David, who focused upon the creative side of production. The individual writing team members included Paul Larson, Abby Grant, Robin Kingsland, James Mason, Ross Hastings, and Brian Truman, a veteran writer of many Cosgrove Hall shows. Thomas was to be one of Brian's final writing contributions before his retirement. His son, Jonathan Truman, wrote a few episodes, including two episodes alongside Phil Fairley and Abby Grant. Phil would go on to develop the Jack in the Pack series. David Mitten continued to direct 24 episodes, while Steve Asquith directed two episodes. David provided story outline ideas written by other writers, and Edward the Very Useful Engine would also be the final episode he had ever written. Alongside Jack and the Sodor Construction Company team, Further characters introduced in the series included Salty, Harvey, Alicia Botti, Cyril the Fogman, Farmer McCall, and Elizabeth, who was to be named Grumpy according to early concept art by Bob Gold Galliers. Chris Lloyd built her normal gauge one and large scale sized models in which the latter model was used to interact with the Scarlowy railway engines. She was also built for speed using brass chassis and plastic body. All of the Thomas characters from the first five series were both rebuilt and refurbished with matte paint over their glossy shiny coat after the Magic Railroad movie. From this series onward, they would utilize the aspect ratio of 16 by 9 widescreen, albeit squashed to the full screen format for DVD releases in other countries. Series 6 would also serve as Alec Baldwin's final season as the narrator, as he left to continue pursuing his movie career. Co-produced between Nick Jr. and Ghislaine, the sixth series premiered in the UK in September 2002 featuring action-packed stories filled with spooks, crashes, adventure, and humor. Albeit on a largely moralistic route, unlike the previous series. In January 2003, the series marked the return to terrestrial television on CITV since 1992. After the sixth series, Hit Entertainment secured the rights to the Thomas brand from Ghislaine for approximately £140 million in a takeover bid. However, this was not the first time that Hit Entertainment tried to buy the rights for Thomas. In early 2000, during the post-production of Thomas and the Magic Railroad, they attempted to offer close to £220 million to acquire the rights from the Brit Allcroft Company. Brit and the board declined the offer. Around the same year, a new range of Thomas H.O. models was produced for the North American fans by Bachman Industries, who went on to produce more models and sets to this very day. 
On December 4, 2002, the fan base grew stronger with the establishment of the Sodor Island Forums. In autumn 2004, a fan site dedicated to the Thomas Fan Forum itself was established and has become one of the most popular Thomas-related websites ever with more than 2,500,000 visitors. The website is regularly updated with new information detailing the history of both the Railway series and Thomas and Friends. As of 2018, the Sodor Island Forums has continued to grow since its inception and now has more than 3,500 members involved in over 5,000 threads, a number that increases daily. On December 26, 2002, Thomas and Friends, The Big Live Tour, made its debut at the National Indoor Arena in Birmingham. This live stage show features Thomas, Percy, James, Gordon, Harold, Jack, and the Fat Controller. Also known as the All Aboard Tour, this show has become one of the nation's most popular family events run by new owners Hit Entertainment through 2006. Of all the large-scale working replica models created by BBC Visual Effects for a tour in 2003, the battery-powered locomotive of James was added to the 2004 Guinness Book of Records as the largest model railway engine ever built, measuring 264.3 centimeters high, 149.6 centimeters wide, and 652 centimeters long, and weighs nearly 1.5 tons. In 2003, Martin Clutterbuck created a Thomas website for dedicated fans of the Railway Series books called The Real Lives of Thomas the Tank Engine. The site itself is filled with an abundance of information about the Railway Series, including merchandise, maps, in-depth articles about the characters, and so much more. Produced during the hit buyout, the seventh series marks the final involvement by several creative members, including director David Mitten, musicians Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell, producer Phil Fairley, and Britt Allcroft, who had served as the non-executive director for Hit Entertainment during this time. The chief executive of Hit, Rob Laws, added, we welcome Britt to the board as the key creative force behind Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. One of the most enduring of children's characters, her knowledge of the Thomas and children's markets will be a valuable addition to the board. This would also be the last season to utilize the 35 millimeter filming equipment in original four and a half minutes format. The seventh season also features the first appearance of the current logo, which reads, Thomas and Friends. This was not the first time that the logo had been updated. It had been given a fresh look during the start of the new millennium for merchandising, including magazines, books, toys, and home video releases. Series 7 introduced several characters, including Emily and Spencer, who both became recurring characters on the show. Out of all the new characters, Fergus, the railway traction engine, made only three appearances in the seventh series. According to Chris Lloyd, his model was damaged during the filming of his debut episode, Bill, Ben, and Fergus, during the landslide sequence. Originally named Clarence, the burgundy-colored tank engine called Arthur was named after the late grandfather of Luke Sharp winner of the TV Mag's engine name competition in November 2003. Newcomer Murdoch, designed by Bob Gold Galliers, was originally going to be designed as a British Railway Standard Class 7. This was changed to a British Railway Standard 9F engine. Additionally, Murdoch's original livery was going to be in maroon red with chrome yellow linings. However, this was already done on Arthur, thus changing Murdoch's livery 
from maroon red to orange with green and red linings. Unlike previous series, David Mitten allowed writers to take creative freedom with their writing style to a much greater level. Toby's Windmill, developed alongside Jan Page, would be David Mitten's final story concept and teleplay for the series. A piece of storyboard by Bob Gold Galliers shows that Percy was originally meant to be the main character in the story, later replaced with Toby. Bob's interview on the Sodor Island fan site revealed similar changes made with other episodes. In Emily's New Coaches, Oliver's supporting role was originally meant for Toby. In Reneus and the Roller Coaster, Peter Sam was originally meant to be the main character. Additionally, some coaches resembling Ada, Jane, and Mabel were set to appear in the episode as well. As for Peter Sam, he had eventually had an episode to himself in the Refreshment Ladies Tea Shop. The seventh series would use significantly more stock footage than any other season, as shown here. When the seventh series began broadcasting on October 6th, it highlighted the show's new direction, featuring exciting new stories with a greater focus on morals. The shift in production would also see the departure of those aforementioned people who worked on the series since day one, including Britt Allcroft herself. In May 2003, Britt stepped down from her position as the non-executive director on Hit's side. Britt now resides in Santa Monica, focusing on her other business interests and created her new show for Disney Junior titled Whisker Haven Tales with the Palace Pets. Although Britt had stepped down from the series, her devotion for Thomas, his railway friends, and her communication with older and younger fans continues through today. In 2004, after its initial airing on Nick Jr. in the UK, the seventh series was shown on CITV in a 10-minute block of two compiled episodes. A majority of the songs created for both season 6 and 7 of Thomas had yet to be released on home video format in the UK and Australia, excluding the Fogman and other stories, featuring Winter Wonderland on October 7, 2002. In 2006, three select songs from the seventh series were included on a promotional DVD with two episodes from Jack and the Pack. In North American and Asian Pacific countries, there were VCDs and DVDs featuring all 12 songs from the aforementioned series. A cassette and CD titled Thomas's Train Yard Tracks featured all the songs from the sixth season alongside the selected ones from both the fourth and fifth seasons. On March 16, 2004, New Friends for Thomas and Other Adventures was released on VHS and DVD in the US. Following Alec Baldwin's departure after the sixth season, there was no other actor available to don Mr. Conductor's hat, so Michael Angelis was asked to re-narrate six episodes. This led to mixed reviews on the choice of having Angelis as the new storyteller for American audiences. Some reviewers criticized him for a lack of enthusiasm and boring tone in his voice, while others accepted his storytelling. Beep beep! What a mess, Puff Thomas. The fat controller was very annoyed. What happened, dear? The trucks were singing. I told them to stop, but they made me go too fast. Please, sir, it's my fault, Thomas told the Fat Controller what he had done. Arthur, it's uh, fruitless for me to say more, but Thomas, you must help clear up this mess. Beep, beep. What a mess, puffed Thomas. Sir Topham Hat was very annoyed. What happened, dear? The freight cars were singing. I told them to stop, but they made me go too fast. Please, sir, it's my fault, Thomas told Sir Topham Hat, 
what he had done. Arthur, it's uh, fruitless for me to say more, but Thomas, you must help clear up this mess. Then, a trailer was featured on the DVD of New Friends for Thomas as an upcoming home video release for North America titled Steamies vs. Diesels, showcasing what's coming up next for Thomas and his friends after the seventh season. Something exciting is happening for Thomas and all his friends. Come on, Percy, hurry up! Chuffed Thomas. Yes, yes, I'm coming, but what's the rush? Chuffed Percy. You'll see, tooted Thomas. What? Thomas, slow down. I'm the express train round here. Huffed Gordon. What on earth's going on? Shouted James. We've got to make it to the station in time for brand new episodes of Thomas and Friends. Make sure you don't miss the new episodes of Thomas every day at 2.30 on Nick Jr. Ever since the takeover bid from Ghislaine back in September 2002, Hit Entertainment went on to produce their own take on the show, starting with the eighth series, moving in a much different direction. Many fans consider this a reboot and re-establishment of the show with more effective marketing after 20 years and seven series using the same format. Changes made included a new intro and end credit sequence, a total running time change from four and a half minutes to seven, and digital Betacam SP technology, replacing the original 35 millimeter cameras, which all served to give the series a brand new look. According to Hit Entertainment, the switch in episode length was to give the stories a proper beginning, middle, and ending structure. Filling David Mitten's shoes as the series director was Steve Asquith, who had been working with David and the Thomas crew for many years. Throughout the first seven series, Steve had worked in several roles prior to becoming a director for the eighth season. He previously directed two episodes for the sixth series featuring Jack and the Pack, plus a proposed spin-off series that will be discussed later. Under Hit, a new production crew stepped in to join Steve, including producer Simon Spencer, script executive Sam Barlow, first camera assistant Nigel Permain, the son of Terry Permain, who worked with the series from the start, and the music team of composer Robert Hartshorn and songwriter Ed Welch. For the new U.S. narrator, Hit Entertainment approached Dempsey and Makepeace star Michael Brandon during his run of Jerry Springer the Opera at the Royal National Theatre in London. Brandon had watched the series on television with his son Alex for many years. After discussions with Hit, Brandon was thrilled to become a part of the history of Thomas. So with much enthusiasm and unique style of narrating Thomas stories, this is the result. The island also has lots and lots of railway lines. Who's that puffing down the track? It's Thomas! Hello, Thomas. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the island of Sodor. In addition to the new aforementioned key production team, some of the veteran crew members also worked on Hit Entertainment's reformat of Thomas, including model and special effects supervisor David Eaves, director of photography Terry Permain, lead model maker Chris Lloyd, and editor Kate Buckland. The new production crew wanted to shift the focus to the eight core engine characters. This included the first seven steam engines created by Audrey and a character who had made her debut on the television series in the previous season, Emily. However, according to Sam Barlow, Duck was originally going to be a part of the group as the eighth character. Emily would add a shift to the series after her debut appearance 
in spite of how much of a bossy boiler she had been, originally like Lucy Van Pelt from Peanuts. Emily is the first female steam locomotive to regularly appear in the television series, becoming a much-needed role model for female fans. Featuring all eight core characters together, the song, Engine Roll Call, centered around the steam team, is heard at the end of every episode from the eighth series onwards. The eighth series was first released on VHS and DVD in the U.S. on May 18, 2004, with Steamies vs. Diesels, and in the U.K. on May 24, with All Aboard with the Steam Team. In autumn 2004, the series was finally aired on both Nick Jr. in the U.K. and PBS in the U.S. This is the first appearance of Thomas on PBS since the end of Shining Time Station in 1997. With the changes made to the show, it was not quite what most Thomas fans had come to expect, especially with how the stories have been simplified in structure to a basic level, as opposed to the original format from the first seven series, as well as little regard for railway realism. A prime example of this being Open wagons filled with fish and chocolate powder, which may be clearly unhygienic to most people, as they should have been properly transported in boxes or containers. Further criticism is reserved for the fact that the engines were self-driven. There was a time when Thomas thought he didn't need a driver, and let me tell you, it didn't go well. The series ignored the original outline created for them, in which no engine would be driven out without the assistance of their crew. This rule would continue to go unnoticed through the transition to CGI. Overall, the engines would go off by themselves without any logical explanation, as opposed to actually doing their job on the railway. In spite of these aforementioned criticisms of the 8th series, it certainly provides some good portents for a whole new beginning of the television show under hit entertainment in these early stages, especially with much longer stories as part of its rebirth. The classic series featured an abundance of crashes. The new production crew deliberately reduced the frequent use of crashes and would only be used when it was justified within the story. This could be related to an article published in March 2003 in which the use of frequent crashes could easily scare young children. The newest element that the 8th series would introduce would be the interactive segments in which young children would learn and have fun through these educational interstitials. These segments feature a mix of CGI and live-action model animation, including deleted scenes that were cut from the final versions of episodes. These were shown during the airing of the 8th series on both PBS and Nick Jr. channels in its half-hour block, along with music videos, a 5-minute episode from the 7th season with new compositions by Robert Hartshorn, and a special opening sequence featuring the forward message taken from Thomas the Tank Engine as read aloud by Nigel Plaskett. Dear Christopher, here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. I hope you will like them because you helped me to make them. Your loving daddy. Both the learning segments and music videos can be found on VHS and DVD releases as well, including Songs from the Station that was released on May 3rd, 2005, featuring full music videos from the 8th season as part of the 60th anniversary product lineup. In early 2005, after its broadcast on Nick Jr. channel in the UK, a selection of Thomas Series 8 episodes aired on CITV, 
with a slightly different opening theme tune. This theme tune can also be heard in several DVD releases in the United States. This would mark the last time Thomas was shown on CITV. The eighth season also marked the final season for Leo Morimoto and the original Japanese voiceover cast. In April 2006, the eighth season was shown on Pankiki, a new series of Pankikis after two years of hiatus following the takeover by Hit Entertainment. Pankiki had been deemed a failure due to poor viewing statistics. Because of this, Fuji Television Kids Entertainment Incorporated canceled the contract of Thomas and other overseas programs that had been associated with it since 1990. This season also marked the beginning for other foreign storytellers around the world. The eighth series of Thomas saw massive shifts and transitions in children's television programming. A new team gave the show a complete rebranding and opened new opportunities to audiences everywhere. But Hit Entertainment was preparing for a special celebration that was coming up in 2005.